the main emphasis of today's seminar is going to be really getting the basics down. So we're going to talk about individual dogs and individual body language of those dogs. And some of these things may be common sense to some of you, but I have to have a starting point. I'm not going to start so far back, though, that I'm going to assume that everybody on the webinar has a general understanding of dog behavior and dog body language, meaning that if you look at the classic pictures of dogs, you see the what is commonly considered a dominant dog, and that's a dog leaning forward, and ears are forward, and the body's forward, and they're staring, and most people would say, okay, that's a dominant or confident dog. And then the other end of the extreme is the dog with ears back, tail back, it's hunched down, which most people would call a submissive dog. Those are the gross generalizations on either end of the spe spectrum, and we're going to be talking about the middle ground, some of the more subtle signatures that dogs do with their bodies in order to understand them. So I'm going to assume everybody knows the common extremes. When we're talking about canine body language, dogs communicate almost entirely through their body. They do have some vocalizations, obviously, but they do say a lot with their body. And if we can learn how to read those signals, you're going to have a much better way of understanding your dog and understanding other dogs that you run into. In terms of why we want to worry about it, if you're an average pet owner, you want to worry about it to be a better advocate for your dog. You can keep your dog safe, you can keep your dog comfortable, you can keep your dog from being put in a situation where he ends up biting, and I see that a lot. A, a lot of people that just inadvertently don't realize their dog is getting stressed and they end up in a situation where the dog is in a predicament where they have to defend themselves. You can also keep your dog safe if you go to a dog park, if you go to a daycare, if you have your dog anywhere where other dogs are going to be interacting with your dog. You can figure out when your dog is saying, help, I need help, I need out of here, when your dog is stressed. If you're running a daycare or you're planning on running a daycare, then obviously you need to understand dog body language to keep all the dogs in your care safe. And it's one thing for an owner to take a dog to a dog park and say, okay, I'm willing to risk this. It's another thing for somebody to give you their dog and say, keep my dog safe. So you really have to understand that canine body language in order to make sure that you're prepared to deal with another person's dog who they've entrusted to you. So we're going to talk about some of the common myths in dog body language. So the things that people say to me all the time that really aren't entirely true. The first one is a wagging tail means the dog's friendly. No, not at all true. <laughs> a wagging tail might indicate the dog is friendly, but it really is an indicator of a whole range of emotions, including, you know, arousal, it can be aggression, it can be a whole bunch of stuff. Both of the dogs in those pictures are doing attack work. If you, if I had a video running and those were live action shots, those dogs' tails are just wagging, wagging, wagging. They're happy to be biting. They're trained to bite. They like biting. Um, a lot of dogs get a, a kick out of aggression, <laughs> so it can be sort of an exhilarating thing. So you're going to see ta tails wagging with dogs that are aggressive. You're going to see tail wags with a dog that's really, really nervous. You'll see a really fast tail wag. So you can't just say the dog's tail's wagging, the dog is happy, or a dog is friendly. You have to look at the speed of the tail wag, the, how high or low the dog's tail is, and you have to look at the relationship of the person and the dog. It may wag differently for different people in different situations. So that generic myth of the tail is, means friendly is not true. Another common myth is that a quiet dog who accepts petting is fine with people. This is the most often heard thing when I have people that come to my office for evaluations or behavioral assessments is they, they'll often say, you know, he's fine. He's fine when people approach. He doesn't mind being petted at all. That word fine doesn't necessarily mean he's enjoying it. A quiet dog who's enjoying petting, he could just be tolerating the petting and just holding himself together going, wow, I really don't like this, but I'm not going to do anything about it. And very often those dogs who people tell me they're fine, usually they're not. They, they really are actually uncomfortable, not happy to be getting petted. And the owner doesn't understand that. An owner thinks, well, he's not doing anything negative or he's not showing any bad behavior, so he's obviously happy being petted. That's not always the case. And very often 
the dog who is just merely tolerating petting will eventually reach some kind of tolerance level and growl. So you want to make sure that, especially if you're interacting with dogs in a daycare environment, that a dog is not just coping. You want them actually enjoying any kind of interaction they're having, whether it's with people or it's with other dogs. You're not just going to accept the fact that, okay, the dog's tolerating it. Because just like humans, toleration only goes so far before we lose our tolerance. Another common myth, dogs love to be hugged and kissed. This actually is that humans love to hug and kiss. Dogs really don't like it. Um, in this particular picture, this is actually one of my instructors. Right here, there's actually a goldfish cracker. <laughs> In case you're wondering how she got that picture. It's a great picture though, but she has a tiny little goldfish cracker in between um, her lips and the dog is eating that. <laughs> Very good bite inhibition on that dog because he's not biting her lip while he does that. But the fact that you can take pictures like this and the fact that you can hug your particular dog doesn't necessarily mean the dog is going to enjoy that from another person. My dog gets hugged a lot every day. I mean, I love to hug my dog. And I think for the most part he tolerates that. It's a behavior I happen to enjoy and I realize that he probably is going, I'm sure if he could roll his eyes that's what he would be doing. He'd be rolling his eyes going, oh great, she's going to hug me again. On the, at the same token, I will not generally hug a dog that I don't know. If you ever work or go to a petting zoo where there's you know little goats and cows and baby animals for children to play with, watch how often they will run up to the baby goat and throw their arms around them. And for the most part, the goats just sort of stand there or they run away. Dogs, not so often. I mean, a lot of dogs will react poorly to that behavior. It is a very common human behavior, though, so we want to make sure that the, we're teaching people dogs don't really like that. And if you watch the dog while it's being hugged, a lot of times you'll see some of the stress indicators that we're going to talk about today in the seminar. And you'll see that although they may not be pulling away, they may not be enjoying it either. So you have to understand that. And that's important for daycares to know because a lot, you know, your daycare staff loves dogs and they're going to be human beings around dogs, which means they're going to be inclined to want to hug the dog and kiss the dog. And you have to really make sure that they understand the signals that that dog might be saying, yeah, I don't really like this, to keep the staff safe. Another common myth that my kids and I can do anything to my dog so other people can do the same thing. Again, this dogs tolerate a lot more just like people do. We tolerate a lot more from the people we know. I'm willing to let certain people, you know, get away with certain things with me where other people I don't want them to do that at all. And the classic example is going into an elevator. If I walk into an elevator and I'm with a bunch of friends, I'm going to be a little closer to them than if I walk into an elevator and there's a total stranger in there. And that's the same thing with, you know, someone that comes up and talks to me. If they move too close into my physical space in any situation, somebody that knows me can get a little bit closer to me than somebody that doesn't know me. But then even with someone I know, there's still variations of how close I want. That's the same with dogs. So you might be able to do something with your dog, and an owner might tell you when he drops their dog off, oh, we do these kinds of things to the dog all the time, and he's fine. Doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to do those things. So that's sort of a generalization. This particular little Pomeranian that's in this picture is sitting on her owner's lap. And she's a very, very needy little dog, and she loves to sit in her owner's lap. She will very rarely go and sit on anybody else's lap. And if you looked at her and tried to pick her up, there's a pretty good chance that she would not like that and she'd run away. So just because she looks you know, cozy and comfortable on her owner's lap doesn't mean she wants to sit in everybody's lap. And that's the thing you have to understand and be able to recognize. A final common myth, and this is really one of my pet peeves, is that supervision is the key to keeping dogs and humans safe. We hear over and over and over, supervise the dog, supervise the dog, supervise the dogs. They, we say that to parents. We say that to dog daycare staffs. We say that to owners who take their dog to the dog park. The problem is, if you don't know what you're looking at, supervision is t completely useless. So just to stress, if you're a daycare owner, just to stress to your staff, you have to supervise, you have to supervise, you have to supervise, is totally irrelevant if they don't know what they're looking at. Most of the clients that we get 
who have come to our office because their dog has bitten, and often it's bitten a child, in almost, I can only think of one time in all the times that this has happened, and we counsel a lot of people on dog bites, um, there's only been one time where I know the dog was actually left alone with the child. 99.9% .9 of the time, the dog bites have occurred and the owner has been standing right there. And they always say, I was supervising, I was standing right there. And it's, they were supervising. The problem is that we preach and preach and preach about supervision, but we don't teach what supervision means. And we don't teach anybody, here's the things you're looking for and here's the things you're trying to avoid. And when you see these things, you need to intervene. Those are the things we don't teach. So that's what we're going to try to talk about today is really understanding what are the split-second instances where you have to go, whoa, that's a stress signal. I need to intervene to help the dog or to help the child or to help the other dog that the two dogs are playing. And you have to be able to do that fast enough. Because if you're waiting for the obvious, the obvious being growling, snapping, biting, you're too late. You need to intervene far before, long before any of that stuff happens. So gross generalizations, when people tell me, or people ask me, what is a happy dog? What's a nervous dog? What does that look like? These are gross generalizations if you are thinking happy dogs. And most of the time, if, you show, if I show pictures, people can usually say happy, nervous, not so happy, stressed. You know, they can usually tell me that. But if I ask them why, a lot of times people don't know why. They just intuitively guess correctly sometimes. And what we need to teach is the specific things you're looking for. So, happy dogs, generally speaking, they're going to have curved bodies. They're going to be more rounded. Um, they're going to have relaxed faces. You can see a lot of tension in a dog's face. And there's some pictures later you'll see where there are, you can actually see veins popping out of the dog's muzzles because the dog's so stressed. You want to see place playful body postures. So looseness in the dog is a good thing. That's generally going to indicate that the dog is not that stressed. And you're going to see normal breathing pattern. So here you have teeth showing. And so a lot of people, when I show them this, they will say, oh, the teeth are showing, they're fighting. These two dogs are actually playing. If you look at the bodies, it's completely relaxed. So there's no tension. There's no stiffening. There's no even right here, a bent foreleg. These dogs are playing. Over here, this is a classic play bow stance, a dog playing um, front shoulders down and then rear end in the, ground, in the air is a playful body language. That's a dog's solicitation to play. And then here, this is one of my client's dogs. They sent me this picture of the dog on the boat, completely relaxed. You can see his, I mean, it's almost as if you picked up his leg, it would just fall right back down there. So very, very relaxed body posture. So when we're talking happy dogs, those are the things we're looking for. And a big key is how stiff is the dog. Because as soon as a dog starts stiffening, it's generally a bad sign. So the opposite extreme, you have the nervous or the stressed dog. Again, tense body, the closed lips. And we'll talk a lot about sometimes just the closing of the mouth is the first indicator you're going to get that a dog is nervous. N very few people recognize that as a body language signal. Most people completely ignore that. But closing the if a dog's panting and you walk up to it and all of a sudden they close their mouth, that's my first indicator that the dog's uncomfortable. If they start breathing normally again, they start panting again, I'm okay with that. But if they stay stiff and they stay um, with their closed mouth, I'm going to be a little bit more cautious about approaching that particular dog. Any kind of change in breathing pattern. So you might see it where a dog comes in from outside and they just get into the daycare room and all of a sudden they're panting really heavily. They haven't exercised, they haven't done anything, they're just really panting heavily all of a sudden. That's a stress indicator. That's the dog going, whoo, kind of like hyperventilating almost. They'll start panting really quickly. Sometimes you'll hear it if they start playing a little bit too crazy. Obviously they're going to be doing it if they get tired, but I'm talking about a change of breathing pattern that doesn't correlate with exercise. It's just they start breathing differently because of the stress. And then again, rigid or straight bo a straight body. So in this um, picture here, you can see this dog has his front legs locked out. He's very stiff. This dog's 
relatively relaxed. He's actually going up, this is at a dog park, this dog is just going up to greet this other one. Um, this dog's pretty comfortable and confident and like, hey, what are you doing? This dog, not so happy to be meeting. So he's reeling back. You can tell his body is going backwards and he's got these legs locked out. So he's a little bit more nervous. Over here, this is a dog who is on a catch ball. So first of all, he is being pushed forward, which he probably doesn't want. But you can see how stiff and taut his body is. Closed mouth. You can see the whites of his eyes, which we're going to talk about in a minute. All of those are stress signals or body um, where the dog is saying, he don't really like this. And nervous or tense dogs aren't necessarily going to bite, but there is obviously a correlation between how nervous the dog is and the potential to bite, so which is why we always say if a dog is nervous or stressed, you want to give the dog some help. If they're in a daycare environment, you want to get them out of the daycare or get them out of that particular play situation, reduce the stress somehow. And keeping yourself safe and keeping the other dog safe, obviously. But it's not that every dog is going to bite if they're stressed. There's just a higher likelihood. Okay, so looking at these two pictures, just think for a minute, and then I'm going to put up a little poll, and everybody can vote of which dog would you approach, the top dog, the bottom dog, would you approach neither dog, or would you approach either one, like you think both of them are fine and you would approach either one. So just think about that, and I'm going to put up a little poll, and everybody gets a chance to vote, um, top one, bottom one, neither dog, or either dog. I'll give you a second. And then everybody can just, I'll give you a second to vote. So just click on whichever one you would vote for. I'll give you like five more seconds. Okay, I will show you the results. So most of you said the top dog you would approach. Nobody said the bottom dog. A couple people said neither dog. A few more people said either dog. I would say, and these are actually pictures that I don't know the dog, but I was sent these pictures. And generally speaking, this does look like a fairly friendly dog. Um, but if I were to pick one and say which one I would approach, it would be the top one partly because that dog is a little bit more alert. Some people look at that and say, oh, he's, you know, focused and fixated and his ears are forward and he's maybe leaning a little forward. He might be, but his eyes are relaxed, his muzzle's relaxed, his mouth is relaxed. The only thing that I wouldn't say is relaxed is actually his ears, and his ears are a little forward, which probably means he's just interested in something. Now, if I started walking towards him and he closed his mouth, then I would wait before I approached him further. The second picture, the, the, he, again, he looks very relaxed. How, and his ears are actually a little bit more relaxed in that picture. But because he's got a closed mouth, either he's totally comfortable and not hot at all, or if this were a dog and that was the look I was getting as I approached him, I would probably slow my approach down. So, and again, it's, gonna be, it's not going to be a forever decision. So in other words, if I start approaching that top dog, and he suddenly closes his mouth and stiffens, I'm going to stop walking forward. But if within a second he goes, oh, you're just a person, no big deal, and he starts panting again, I'm going to keep continuing forward. So it's not going to be that I'm going to say, okay, never going to approach him. It's a continuum. And throughout dog interactions, everything happens quickly, and everything happens on a huge continuum. So you do have to look at that in terms of what what are you going to do and how are you going to react. It's never just a stationary one decision and then that's the end of it. So common stress signals. The, there are tons and tons and tons of stress signals. And when I'm talking stress signals, I'm th saying things that dogs do that indicate they're a little bit nervous. So There's some discussion that stress signals are done in order to calm the dog down. Some people say they're done in order to calm the approaching animal down. And there's, and there's different differing agreements on that. What I would say for sure is that stress signals are things that dogs do when they're nervous, when they're just feeling a little uncomfortable. And again, it doesn't mean they're going to bite. It just means they're going, okay, this is a little weird. 
and maybe a second later they'll change. But you want to be keying on these things the instant they're happening, particularly if you have dogs playing, because then you're reading really fluid motion in a, ver a large number of dogs. So it's hard enough when you're doing it with just one, but when you've got a group of dogs playing, you're trying to identify some of these things really quickly in a large number of dogs. And if you key in on specific things, it'll just help you and it'll help if you're teaching your staff. So some of the common ones that I would say are relatively easy to identify and easy to teach others are listed here. Um, and I'll show some pictures of these, but avoiding eye contact is just turning away from the dog. The closed mouth we talked about, dilated pupils where the pupils are really large and actually appear to be reflecting light. That's one of the biggest ways you can tell dilated pupils. Drooling, and I don't mean some dogs just drool, so I don't mean the dog that just drools because it's a particular breed. I'm talking excessive drooling that's out of context with the breed or with the situation. So you'll generally see a lot more drooling. Half moon eye is where you can see the whites of a, dog, a dog's eyes, and it usually means they're not quite staring. They're sort of looking out of the corner of their eye. Lip licking is exactly that. You'll see the tongue flick come out of a dog's a tongue come out of the dog's mouth and flick its nose. Often the faster it does it, the more nervous the dog is. Panting irregularly, which we talked about. Piloerection is the hair standing up on the dog's back, which a lot of people say that that is aggression, and it's it it might be at times, but most of the time I see it, it's just an arousal in the dog or an excitement. It's just the dog going, whoa, kind of in over my element here. Doesn't necessarily mean the dog's about to bite. It's just, an, again, it's just another sign that the dog's getting a little bit unsure of himself. Shaking off is what dogs do when, after they take a bath and they shake. They also do that when they're a little bit nervous. It's, it's often sort of a gathering situation where they're just kind of like, whoa, that was stressful. I need to get myself together then you'll see them shake off. We will see it a lot if we approach a dog and pet the dog for a second and then the dog decides they don't want to stay with us, they'll walk away and shake off. It's almost as if the dog is like gathering himself again, saying, well, that's kind of stressful, but I'm, i got to shake off and readjust. And then yawning. Yawning, very often people will say when their dog yawns, oh, you must be bored. And it's really not the dog being bored, it's the dog being a little nervous. We see it a lot in training classes when owners are doing a stay. So they'll tell their dog to sit and stay, and they'll walk away. And as they're walking away, the dog lets out a big yawn, which is the dog going, ah, I'm not really sure what we're doing. <laughs> but almost always the owner turns around and goes, oh, you can't be bored right now, we're in training class. But it's not a boredom situation, it's, it's the dog being a little bit nervous. So eye contact avoidance. Again, this is the dog not wanting to make direct eye contact. And a direct eye contact can be either pleasant, friendly, happy, or it can be a hard stare where you're like, ooh, that dog wants me to get away. Eye contact avoidance is just that. They're not looking at you at all. They really can't look. And so this dog here, this was a dog I was standing right in front of it for quite some time, and he just could not look at me, ever. You can also see in this dog the whites of its eyes. That's that half moon eye. And then here, this dog is just barking at something, who knows what. I think he's really just anxious. But you can see he's the, the person is standing over here, and he just can't quite look at him. So those are both the dog looking away. So when you get a dog and you're trying to approach it, or you'll get this between two dogs as well, if you get a lot of that, I'm not here, I'm not here, I'm not here, I'm not looking at you, that's a dog saying, leave me alone. So if you continue to approach... There's a good indication that that dog, or there's a good probability that that, that dog is going to turn to you and say stronger, in stronger language, look, I already told you I don't want to deal with you. Which means if you avoid the eye contact and you keep approaching, he may then growl or snarl. You would hope that he would just leave. But if he can't leave, you're kind of forcing him to make another decision to possibly aggress at you. And that's true in daycare dogs. If you have two dogs playing, and one of them is laying on the ground looking away and there's another one trying to play with him and the one keeps looking away and looking away and avoiding and avoiding and avoiding and the, somebody doesn't go and get that other dog away, it's likely that you'll end up with a, a fight because the eye contact avoidance is an indicator for him to say, you know what, I don't want you to play with me right now, so leave. The ideal situation is that the dog that sees the eye contact avoidance will go, oh yeah, you don't want to play, okay, I'm leaving. 
but not all dogs get that. Dilated pupils. This picture is a dog who actually is barking at another dog. We just happen to have a photographer there who got a really good close-up of the dog's face. And so you can see um, a couple of things. The dilated pupils, obviously they're very large. The problem is on, and they're easy to see on this dog because he's a yellow dog, but on a lot of dogs, it's, those are hard to see. But what you're looking at is, see that reflection, how it's re so reflective? Even on a dark dog with dark eyes, you'll get that reflection back. So even though it, you can't really tell the pupil dilation, if you have a really black dog and then really dark eyes, it's hard to see, you will see a difference in the reflection of the eyes. So you, you can tell it that way too. This dog you can also see right here, the veins popping out. That's all that tension in the muzzle I talked about before. And obviously he's barking, but very, very ten tense muzzle. And you can sometimes see these veins in a dog that's not barking. So he's just kind of standing there, but you can just see them stiffening their muzzle. And, it, and often that will go along with a dog that's closing his mouth and stiffening. This is that half moon eye that I mentioned. And the half moon eye, this is that same dog from the prior picture we just looked on the side of it. Um, but you can see it's almost like the whites of a dog's eyes where they don't normally show, you'll start seeing more of those. And this might happen just for a few seconds and then go away. Um, you'll see video in the couple of weeks of a dog that I am hugging. And every time I hug it, he, half moon, he show, does a half moon eye. And then when I stop hugging it, it goes away. So you can really get a good indicator for a dog's level of nervousness by looking at their eyes. Again, the half moon eye, very often completely ignored by owners. They don't see that at all. They don't even notice whether the dog has the whites of its eyes showing or not. And yes, there are breeds that have more white showing as a breed, but what I'm talking about is when it's um, a little bit more unusual, abnormal. So you want to look at that. The lip licking. This is again one of the most easiest, one of the easiest things to recognize is a dog licking its lip. So often ignored. So most owners won't even notice this at all. And you'll get lip licking like multiple times and an owner ha pays no attention to it because most of them don't recognize this as a stress signal. But you can see it and you'll see it in very relaxed dogs, you'll, but you'll, it does mean that they're starting to get a little bit nervous. This top dog in this picture was at the shelter and we actually brought the dog in. As soon as we brought the dog in, she was a really, really sweet dog. We all loved her. She was a very soft, nice little dog that got adopted by somebody. But as soon as we brought her in, she started licking her lips. And then she settled down and she stopped licking her lips. And then when we went to hug her, she started her licking her lips again. And it was just her way of saying, wow, this is a little bit weird. But everything else about her was fine. So again, when, when I, you're going to after we finish this seminar, you're going to go out and look at dogs and you're going to see stress everywhere. <laughs> that's, that's the bad thing, is you're going to start going, oh my gosh, all these dogs are totally stressed. And to some extent, dogs are stressed a lot. I mean, they're really kind of living in a world that's not their own. And so, yeah, there are a lot of times when they're stressed. You're not going to have to be freaking out about every single stress indicator you see. What you're looking for is are they multiplying and are they getting stronger and are they staying and not going away? Those are all the things you're looking at. So in this dog on the top, she did get a little bit nervous when she first came in this room where we were going to do a behavioral assessment with her because we just took her out of one environment into a brand new one and there were about four people in there and a video camera and we're all talking and it was a strange room she'd never been in. So yeah, she was a little bit stressed, but she calmed down really quickly. She also doesn't have a whole lot of other stress signals. So on the range of how nervous were we of her, we weren't because she was very relaxed. Same thing with that bottom dog. I mean, a little alert on something, but not totally freaking out. And a great picture of the lip licking though with that bottom dog. But you, so that's what you're going to look at is how long is it lasting? What is average for a particular dog? In daycare, especially, you're going to start to recognize what your dogs are normally acting like. And once you have dogs in your daycare and they've been coming for a while, you get very familiar with their behavior. So then what you're going to be keying on is when are changes occurring. And if, especially if you bring a new dog in, 
to the daycare is this one particular dog who generally isn't stressed at all, all of a sudden really, really stressed. And if you're seeing that, that's going to be an indicator to you. For your own dog, you're going to know that there's certain things that they always do that causes, that you always do that causes them a little bit of stress. And you're not going to necessarily worry about those. But if you see more and more stress occurring, you're going to have to say, okay, we need to help the dog. So a good example is my German Shepherd. I have an eight-year-old German Shepherd who sort of is afraid of the world and <laughs> she lives in a certain amount of stress all the time but in the house she's much less stressful obviously than outside but she has a certain level of stress all the time so if I if I see her exhibiting that level which is what I'll call her normal level I'm not totally worried about it what I worry about with her is when I start to see an increase in what is her normal level and her normal level of stress is always higher than my other lab my other dog which is a lab so just because of their differences in personality so you're gonna you have to understand that too so you're not just gonna go out and go okay every dog in the world is stressed they are to some extent but you wanna make sure that you're looking at continual stress that you wanna pay attention to and then changes in stress for the worse or for the bet or for the better this is a dog that is one of my, it's one of my trainer's dogs. She actually was in a seminar and I just took this picture while she was up on the stage. Now, what she had done was she walked into the building and up onto a stage. She had not been exercising, she had not been run, she had not done any kind of physical activity. But you can see how much she's panting. And if you look at her tongue, her tongue is very stiff. That's not, you know, if you think about a dog who's been exercising and they are panting because they're tired their tongue is generally like flopping all the way you know out and over to the side and it's very very relaxed that's not the kind of panting she's doing so when I'm talking stress signal as panting as a stress signal you're looking at more than just is the dog panting and and again this dog had not been exercised he just she just walked in and because of the nervousness she was feeling she's a very very fearful dog that's why she has her tongue all askew and really tight and a very wide open mouth pant and it's a very shallow pant so if you heard her it would not be it would be a very fast shallow panting she's doing you can see this tension in her muzzle so these little veins here her ears are back so she's a little bit nervous from that too but when you and again she's not doing anything but except standing still she's not barking she's not growling she's not doing anything but you can see the tension in her face and she is um, a fearful dog so just being in a room not really particularly near anybody but just being in a room was really stressful for her so that's a good indicator of sort of that look of panting when a dog is nervous that that you wanna make sure you're paying attention to shaking off this is just a little beagle at the shelter who's shaking and again now dogs will shake off if they have an ear infection or if they're wet so you are going to see some of that normal dog behavior that doesn't mean they're stressed and obviously if I have a dog that's shaking its head all the time I am going to check for an ear infection but this shaking off is just you pet the dog and then they shake or you interact with the dog and then they shake or they and you'll see a video in a couple weeks of two dogs that go up and greet each other neither one of them neither one of them wants to play and they both they both walk away and shake off and it's really just the lo the dog sort of collecting himself again and saying whoo got to got to re reorient myself so when you see that again it's an indicator that the dog doesn't particularly want to be wherever it, it was we look at it a lot when we meet a dog so we meet a dog it comes up we pet it it walks away and shakes off that's a that's the dog going you know what don't particularly like you so if you think about the dogs that you know that enjoy your company, whether it's your own dogs or, you know, friends' dogs or dogs that have been coming to your daycare for a long time, think about how many of those walk away and shake off from you. I mean, I can't even remember the last time that my lab, even after I've just annoyed him by hugging him, he doesn't walk away and shake off. He generally just hangs out with me. But it's generally new dogs that don't know you as well that are doing this little of... Ooh, that was a little stressful I got to shake off and figure out what what's going on so shaking off and again this is one that's really easy to recognize but so often not noticed because it doesn't people don't think of it as a stress signal yawning um, 
dogs yawn in a lot of different situations and in a lot of different ways. So these three pictures show just a couple of differences in the yawns. And sometimes you'll see little half yawns where a dog is trying to release a little tension but not quite there. The little white dog up here on the top is actually doing, it looks like a play bow. So it's very much that same, you know, shoulder forward, head, I mean, rear end in the air position. He's actually stretching though. And that, a yawn and a stretch combined, it often happens together. That is just the dog sort of relieving stress. So now he looks relatively relaxed otherwise. So I don't think he's about to bite or, you know, do anything aggressive. But there's probably something going on where he's just saying, whoo, got to just stretch off a second and relax and see what's going on. So you want to look for that in, in your dogs in daycare. If you've got a, a lot of dogs that are yawning over and over and over, they're doing, you need to help them. You need to get them out of that situation. Again, if it's one yawn and it goes away, I wouldn't worry about it. But if it's a yawn and dilated pupils and drooling and you, know, you start having multiple things happening, then it's something that you want to pay attention to and make sure you can get intervene somehow to help out the dogs or the people that are interacting with them. And again, yawning, the owner, common owner response is, oh, you must be bored or you must be tired. And it's very seldom do the owners go, oh, wow, he's yawning, he's a little bit stressed because we haven't taught them that. So very often we'll talk to owners whose dog has bitten and they'll say, oh, I just thought he was tired, you know, he yawned a little or he's turned away from, you know, whoever approached and then all of a sudden he bit. And that all of a sudden he bit was not so all of a sudden if you can backstep and play through the event and actually see the dog's behavior. There were lots of little tiny signals that people just don't really recognize that happened before the bite. And again, if you're, if you're looking at more than one dog at a time, you're trying to read more than one dog body language, it's even harder. So that's why you really want to key in on a few common things you can, you can see pretty quickly. So combinations of stress signals, because you're very rarely going to just get one independent stress signal. And we can do it on pictures because we can take a snapshot of instantaneously what's happening. But real dog behavior is obviously much more quickly, <laughs> much more fluid. And you'll see when we start showing videotape how quickly it all happens. So you can take, you know, a, a 30 second clip and slow it down to a minute and a half and you'll see so many things going on. And that's some of the stuff we'll do in upcoming upcoming weeks. But when you typically you're gonna see it, you're gonna see combinations. So here you have relatively relaxed dog. Ears are back a little bit, um, but his tongue's coming out. He's just about to lick his lips. So this was just shot just before the dog was about to lick his lips. But if you look at the lip, the this is the classic, he looks sorry behavior. I don't know what the situation was in this. This is a picture that I was given, but a series of pictures I was given. But in this picture you would it's the classic picture that women would like to go and take care of this dog because she looks needy and sad and <laughs> we want to help her. Um, and it looks like really she was just yelled at and she's doing some kind of appeasement gesture. I don't know if that's the case. I, this is not a dog I would rush up to approach though, although very often and often you'll find women want to approach these kinds of dogs. But if you look at her tongue's just coming out, her ears are back, she's a little bit nervous, but she doesn't have the whites of her eyes showing and her muzzle's relatively relaxed. So I would venture to say she's in front of someone that she knows at least a little bit, if not pretty well. But you're going to see more than you're going to often see more than one thing at a time. Here is a little Springer Spaniel puppy. Um, a little bit of stiffening, a little bit of, I don't think this is eye contact avoidance. She's actually looking at somebody or something. Um, but you can see that distinct whites of her eyes. And she just seems a little bit stiff in her shoulders, right around her legs. So all in this area. Um, but huge whites of her eyes. That's not normal. And again, this is a snapshot, so I don't know, two seconds later, she may have been completely relaxed and playing and wiggling all over. But in this snapshot picture, I would say, ooh, she's a little bit worried about something. And look at it and say, whites of the eyes, big, that's a big issue. And a little bit of stiffening, which in her shoulders, would I would say, is the other issue. This is 
this is the dog that I showed early on that had the um, eye contact avoidance. And now what I've asked the owner to do is pet her because the, I was not going to pet this dog. I was with this dog for about an hour. And the, this is the one where and the owner would tell me that the dog loved being petted, loved all people, and was fine with them. And that was not what I was getting. And this picture here was we had been in the room for about an hour. We're in a big, huge warehouse, about 6,000 square feet, a little over that. There's nobody in the room except the owner, me, the person who's videotaping, which is another one of my instructors, and then there's another dog there, which is the dog that this dog lives with. So this is not, you know, in the scheme of things, it's not a high-stress environment. There's just a few people in a big room hanging out with this dog for about an hour. And the owner kept telling me she's really friendly, you can pet her. She was showing whites of her eyes. She was not ever, she never opened her mouth to pant normally or breathe normally. So I asked the owner, well then can you pet her? As soon as, and then this was actually a still shot taken from the video camera, but as soon as her hand came down, his tongue came out. You can see the whites of his eyes here and just pretty stiff overall. It's hard to tell because the dog is so shaggy, but if I had played this in live video, it would look about like this. She, this dog very seldom moved at all. It was almost like catatonic. But this is the owner's hand petting the dog, and the dog's tongue comes out. So not particularly thrilled to be petted even by his own owner. I mean, not that he was going to bite his owner, but he was just nervous. The whole environment was nerve-wracking nerve to him. Okay, so here's another which dog would you approach. Hopefully this is a little bit easier. Um, would you approach, these are both little puppies. So would you approach the dog on the top, the dog on the bottom, either dog you would approach, or neither dog you would approach. So I'll let you vote on that. I'll wait about five more seconds. Okay, so here are the results of that one. Um, about 8% for the top dog that you would approach, 77. Most of you approach, would approach the bottom dog, and then a couple of you would approach either dog. In the and uh, these are two puppies so and you'll we're going to talk about approaching a dog in a minute and one of the risk factors is age of the dog age of the dog the younger the dog obviously the less risk not that puppies can't bite because they can and i've seen some pretty nasty puppies so <laughs> i would i am cautious about approaching puppies at times but on the scale of you know how much damage can a puppy do versus how much damage can a full grown adult do yeah a puppy can do less damage generally speaking so in some respects, you might say, oh, it's a puppy, I'm going to approach him either way. But this puppy, they're both, you know, chewing on something, which is normal puppy behavior. This one, though, you can see the whites of his eyes, a little bit of a furrowed brow. This dog is much more relaxed. Um, tiny, tiny whites of the eyes, but I would, I would say that's probably not stress. That's probably just the dog. Um, this dog's a little bit more stiff than this dog is. This dog's legs are kind of sprawled out again where like if you pick the leg up it would probably just fall right back down I would guess that this dog is is doing a little bit of guarding of this toy that he has in his mouth this dog I don't think is guarding I'm not getting that tension in the muzzle to where I would say oh yeah he doesn't want you to take that this dog I think is saying I don't want you to take this now would he bite me if I approached I don't know because I don't know this dog but when you're looking at what do we teach people to look for this is the early this is an early warning sign that i would be saying you know what not quite right so then you're you either take the viewpoint of i'm just going to challenge him and barge in there and teach him who's boss or you take the viewpoint of let's make it a little bit more or a little bit less stressful for him by doing some other type of training and my vote would be to make it less stressful for him if if you barge in and say I'm just going to take it and teach him who's boss that might work if it works it's because you were able to intimidate the dog 
if it, which I don't generally recommend as a training method. If it doesn't work though, you're, what you're going to end up with is this dog escalating his behavior. So if you approach and you say, I'm taking that toy, it's mine, and I'm bigger than you, and I'm more powerful than you, and I'm the owner, and so I'm taking it, and this dog says, uh-uh, I don't think so, he's liable to just increase his aggression. So then you have to re increase your aggression, and you end up with this spiraling conflict. If it, if it doesn't reach that point, and you are able to take it, you've probably just taken it because you intimidated the dog. So that's not really necessarily the best option either. But when you're looking at just stress signals from a distance, I would be saying this dog is showing early signs of resource guarding in this picture. Now again, maybe the next second after this, he's racing around playing like a lunatic. But in this snapshot of a picture, in terms of teaching people, I'm, I would say, look at his, look at his um, eye, the whites of his eyes are showing, look at the furrowed bow, look at the little bit of stiffening, and I would say that's an early warning sign. And resource guarding, which is a dog that wants to keep something it has, whether it's an object, you can have dogs that resource guard things like toys or food or a Kleenex box or whatever, things that they have. You can have dogs that resource guard people, so a dog may guard you, and if, especially in a daycare, it's not uncommon that a dog will move against a, one of the daycare staff and then guard that daycare staff from other dogs, I mean from other uh, yeah, other dogs that come up to that person. You can have dogs that resource guard locations, so laying on the bed and they don't want other, other dogs on the bed or other people on the bed with them. Those are all important things in terms of body language to really identify because the sooner you see it, the more the more you can do about it in terms of not just training, but in terms of preventing an escalation and preventing a fight, particularly in a pack, in a group of dogs, like in a daycare environment. The other thing that's important to understand about resource guarding is resource guarding between dogs and between people are not necessarily the same thing. So you can have a dog that guards things from people and doesn't guard them from dogs and vice versa. You can have a dog that guards from dogs but doesn't guard from people. So if you're testing in this situation, let's say you have this little beagle and he's doing a little bit of resource guarding with people, doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be that way with dogs. If you are going to put him with dogs and you've tested him for people resource guarding and you say, oh, he doesn't resource guard with people, doesn't necessarily mean he's going to still be a daycare de candidate. So you, if you're going to test for resource guarding in a daycare environment, you need to be able to test around with dogs. And more importantly, I think testing has limitations in a daycare environment. I think you might be able to test and the dog doesn't guard with a particular dog or a particular object, but later you'll find there are guarding behaviors. So the bigger thing is being able to identify early on, at this early stage, little tiny subtle signs that say the dog is starting to guard before it escalates into a fight. Um, I've had dogs in daycare that guarded only rope toys. You know, they were fine with every toy in the world except a rope toy. I've had dogs that guarded only certain people or only certain locations. And they're good dogs. I don't want to kick them out of daycare, but I have to realize, okay, these beds can't be out when this dog's here, or this dog toy, this type of dog toy can't be out when this dog's here, or my staff needs to identi identify when the dog's guarding so they can walk away to prevent the behavior from getting worse. If another dog approaches and they're with that dog, they need to walk away. So you have to be able to identify those things quickly before they escalate. So understanding the approach, we look at all of those stress signals or some of those stress signals and how do they, how do we use them to our advantage when we're meeting a dog? This is an um, acronym SCAN and this, this is borrowed from Sue Sternberg who created this acronym and she uses it for approaching dogs in a shelter environment who you don't know at all. I actually think it's useful for any dog because a lot of times the owners don't necessarily know how to describe their dog's behavior to you in a way that will keep you safe. So I will always take what the owner tells me and I, you know, and I put it in the back of my mind because that's good information, but I also want to do my own assessment. And this is the assessment that we teach all of our staff. Anytime they're going to deal with a client, um, whether it's an owner's dog, it's a shelter dog, it's um, a dog from a rescue group, it's a dog coming into daycare, whatever. Anytime you're interacting with a dog, 
you should mentally go through this. And the, the more of these um, safety scan items that the dog has, the higher risk you are of being bitten by the dog. So we always put things in the negative. So <laughs> high risk of being bitten, um, the more of these you have. So sexually mature is the age of the dog, which we talked about before. Again, a, a puppy can still hurt you, but it's more uh, less likely to do a lot of damage than an adult dog is. And sexually mature also is um, neutered versus unneutered. So a, a neutered, an unneutered male more likely to do it, have a damaging bite than a neutered male. And that is just statistically. So if um, one of my safety scans is you know, sexually mature and it's an adult dog versus a puppy, right off the bat I'm a little less worried about the puppy. Not that I can't get bitten by a puppy, but a little less worried. Um, cautious, and cautious is of the environment or of people. So cautious of the environment or cautious of the people that are in the environment. And some dogs will be cautious of both. Some dogs will not care at all about the environment, but they are completely freaked out by any humans that approach them. Some dogs are fine with people. They are very clingy, want to be near you, but you know they're totally freaked out by the plastic bag you have in the corner of the room. So that would be cautious of the environment. Generally speaking, a dog that's more cautious is a little more on edge, and any dog that's more on edge is more likely to bite quickly. So they're making, they're a little bit, just like when we get on edge, and we're sort of edgy, and we've had a hard day, and you know you snap really quickly at your spouse who asks you just some generic question but you're just you know at the end of your rope um, that's the same thing with dogs is when they're really sort of walking on eggshells because they're a little bit nervous if you do something quickly that startles them you may get a, um, a bad reaction from that so that's why you want to notice the cautious dog the A is aroused and arousal in dogs we'll talk a little bit more about this but arousal in dogs is really that level of excitement or agitation or activity it's not it's not a sexual arousal i don't mean th i don't mean it that way it's more just an idea of how excited is the dog it can be just happy excitement it can be agitation nervousness it can be just a high energy level when we talk about a dog daycare we're really looking at arousal in terms of how much energy is in the room and with especially with the dog daycare the more energy in the room the more likely it is that you're going to get a fight so we always keep the arousal level low in a in a group of dogs same thing at a dog park if if i take my dog to a dog park he is called back to me fairly frequently to bring his arousal level down i don't want him just racing around the room in a free-for-all because the, the more arousal you get the more likely you're going to get some kind of an aggressive incident not necessarily because he's going to start it, but he may just stumble into it. So arousal is something to really pay attention to. One of the um, examples that we've been using lately is in terms of comic strip characters. If you think of arousal versus non-arousal. If you think of like Winnie the Pooh. You know, laid back, kind of calm, kind of even keel, thinks through things. I like Winnie the Pooh. On the on the other hand, arousal would be Tigger. You know, happy, 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 bouncing everywhere, really excited. Very happy little animal, Tigger is, but very aroused. He's just on edge in a happy kind of way. But that's the difference. When we're talking arousal in dogs, it's not necessarily aggression. It's just that sort of like, whoa, kind of state where the dog is just really, really excited. The N is no signs of friendliness. Very often, no signs of friendliness are the dogs that people say are fine. He's fine. He loves people. He really, he, he's fine. That term fine, I have decided. So make note of this and then email me and tell me if you think this is true. But I really start, I really do think that people describe their dogs as fine when they see no behavior. So lack of behavior is very often given the description fine. And it doesn't necessarily mean the dog is fine. Usually it means the dog is tolerating whatever it's exposed to. And it's neither showing happiness nor is it showing aggression. It's just right in the middle. That's fine. <laughs> but fine might mean that the dog is really, really calm, laid back. But you would usually see some signs of friendliness in a dog that you're just approaching. When you see no signs of friendliness, that tells you something. So if I 
go and meet a dog you know they come into my lobby and they're gonna want their dog to come into daycare and I'm being nice and friendly and sweet to the dog and they are just standing there that to me is an indicator of no signs of friendliness now you might see the other extreme when they're actually actively trying to get away from you obviously that's fear and then you'll sometimes see the dog that will come rushing forward and want to interact with you and that is generally friendliness it might be arousal which we'll talk about in a second it's when I don't see any of it you know no tail wagging no ears changing no forward motion on the dog that's no signs of friendliness is a huge indicator and the owner that then says oh he's fine with people I'm always very very cautious about that because not approaching me is an indicator right off the bat so the we teach in our clients and we teach our daycare staff you always want the dog to come to you you know and your own your owners know this like the owners who have fearful dogs will say he's fine as long as he comes up to you well that's true of all dogs I mean that should not be just fearful dogs you're doing that with all dogs you should let them approach the dog is generally much more comfortable that way as opposed to you approaching them but particularly those dogs that don't try any don't show any sign of friendliness to begin with if they aren't showing you friendliness then your approaching them is probably just going to scare them or cause them more conflict so the common example I like to use is the Santa Claus analogy where you have children infants you know going to the mall to get their picture taken with Santa and if you ever have a chance just hang out at the mall and watch the Santa Claus line and you will see fairly frequently the child who doesn't want to see Santa <laughs> and so they're crying and whining and yanking on their mom's or dad's you know sleeve going I don't want to go I don't want to go I don't want to go and yet the parent keeps going closer and coming closer and coming closer because in our you know parental minds we're saying it's just Santa Claus you don't need to be afraid of Santa Claus that makes no sense to the person to the child who is just getting more and more worried about the scary man in the red suit and the big white beard so in our what we like to think is well we'll just plop the baby down in Santa's lap and then everything will be fine because after all it's just Santa Claus that doesn't help if the child's already going whoa freaking out freaking out freaking out you pushing her closer and forcing her to go see Santa Claus him or her isn't generally gonna help usually at that point they will start screaming bloody murder and that's the same thing with the dogs if the dog is keeping his distance and saying don't want to see you don't want to see you don't want to see you because that's his way of saying it if you then keep approaching you're liable to cause him to become aggressive or run away or fight or whatever but no sign of friendliness is a huge issue for me and that is often one of the first things I'll see is the dog says I don't want to meet you and then again you're gonna look at the more of these you have in one particular dog the more at risk you are now when we do this it's just taken me several minutes to explain it when I when I look at a dog I go through the safety scan instantaneous it's you know it happens within seconds when you're first teaching your whether it's your family your staff your um, new new people that are working with you when you're teaching them I would force them to go through it verbally and say it out loud so you can talk about it but as you practice it you're gonna do it instantaneously it'll take you you know nanoseconds to come up with this I'm safe I'm not safe I'm really really not safe or you know I'm not too worried at all and then you're going to uh, assess that continuously as you interact with a dog and these factors I think are just as applicable to dogs meeting another dog so if you have uh, an older adult dog who's cautious or aroused maybe both um, not showing a lot of friendliness towards another dog that other dog is at high risk so when you're doing dog to dog introductions which we're gonna spend an entire week um, session on that becomes an issue too now in terms of that friendliness versus arousal issue there's th when I say you know the dog should approach you and that's much better or let the dog you know come up on its own the thing you have to look at is there's three basic ways that a dog can approach a, um, a person or another dog there's a sociable way there's a, an avoidance which is basically they don't approach and then there's arousal arousal is very often mistaken for friendliness and you'll see some videotape on this in the upcoming weeks but 
so often arousal people will tell me though look how friendly he is he loves you and it's not I'm not seeing friendliness at all I'm seeing high 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 arousal so sociable dogs that are approaching they will come up to you and they want to interact with you and they want to stay with you they might walk away they might even shake off but they'll turn right back around and come right back to you so sociable dogs the key is they want to stay with you and when you start petting them they like it and they stay to get more of it if you stop petting him petting them the social dog you stop petting typically they will ask for more they'll lean into you they'll lean on to you they might paw at you um, they'll try to solicit your intention they'll try to engage with you the dog that's avoiding obviously is not even coming to you they're staying away actively getting to the end of the leash to try to get away from you those are the ones you're going to use a lot of caution with because they're a little bit nervous but then you have the aroused dog the aroused dog will come barreling up to you and appear just like the social dog does but if you start petting the aroused dog usually they will leave and if you don't pet them they don't care all they will do is sniff you from head to toe I mean they'll sniff and sniff and sniff and sniff they'll sniff your shoe they'll sniff your pants they'll sniff your arm they just want to check you out but as soon as you start to pet them they will duck their head and move away or they will duck away and go to a different side of you to pet the other to sniff the other side of you so the difference between the aroused dog and the sociable dog is the sociable dog stays and wants to be petted the aroused dog doesn't so we do a lot of a lot of assessments with owners who tell us their dog is really friendly and what we're seeing is arousal so we'll have often another person come in and we'll we'll have them meet this dog and we'll tell the owner okay watch and generally what the dog will do is they'll rush up to the person they might even jump on them and they look really excited so they do look happy but they'll sniff and sniff and then walk away and usually go past the person to you know whatever's behind them and it's if you look at it in that sense you can you can tell that it's not a dog that wants to interact it's a dog that wants to check somebody out and then move on this is really key for dogs that are in a daycare because you will get a lot of owners that will bring high aroused dogs to daycare and they think the dog really wants to play and the dog might want to play but they're really aroused and so what you're seeing is not oh yeah I want to play it's oh wow I'm very aroused and crazy and I just want to use up my energy and they might be really really playful dogs once they get going but I would always be more cautious of the dog that is come comes barreling into a room full of other dogs just raring to play that's really not the most um, polite greeting behavior in from one dog to another so high arousal is a huge issue in both dogs meeting people and dogs meeting other dogs that you want to watch out for and very very often you're fighting against what the owner is telling you because the owner is telling you it's a really friendly dog and you don't necessarily have to tell the owner you disagree but you have to know that you need to look at it from a different level than what the owner is looking at arousal and aggression this is why I'm really harping on arousal today um, when we as we go on in the webinar you're gonna see a lot of video footage and we'll be talking about why arousal is such an issue with dogs arousal and aggression is very very closely linked so uh, again I talked about arousal as that high state of energy this that really really excited sort of the tigger <laughs> behavior in a dog might be really playful the dog just might be full of energy wanting to play it could also be extreme stress often it's a combination it might be a dog that really wants to play but they're just starting to get a little bit excited or overly excited the bigger thing to pay attention to is that arousal is very closely linked to aggression and a highly aroused dog it can bleed over into aggression really really quickly this is why sometimes I don't I'm not a big fan of dog parks at times because for the most part in in and I'm talking not every dog park some dog parks are very well run by um, very knowledgeable owners but a lot of dog parks are kind of social hangouts for people and dogs and the people are doing their own social thing talking and really not paying much attention to their dogs and it becomes kind of a free-for-all well just like I would not let my kids go to the playground and not pay attention to them uh, neither would I do that with my dog and in a daycare environment this is one of the reasons that we say that 
you need to have daycare staff on hand because if you just let the dog sort of have a free-for-all they might be playing but that playing can turn to fighting really quickly and it spirals out of control it's it's very much like the kids on the playground that are pushing and laughing and pushing and laughing and pushing and laughing and then all of a sudden one final push and they start screaming at each other or yelling or or getting into a little tiff and dogs are the same way they starts out kind of fun and then it just clicks over one too many times and it turns into aggression we had Trish King come to our, our office to do a seminar and one of the things she talked about was the chemical makeup in a dog's body when they're aroused and it's identical to when they're being, becoming aggressive so the chemical makeup is exactly the same which I thought was interesting because I always knew that arousal was linked to aggression but it's really not just behaviorally but physiologically it's linked as well so when you get this high state of energy in a dog you want to calm them do down in our play groups with our owners we calm them down by having all the owners call their dog to them and have them sit and just take you know a 30 second break if I take my dog to the dog park I routinely recall him to me have him sit and then I let him go again it's not you know 40 minutes of training it's just a quick you come to me let's calm down a second okay go play that's what we have our owners do in our playgroups that's what daycare should be doing so when the dogs start getting a little bit too rambunctious they need to be settled down they need to physically you need to go in between the dogs that are too aroused so that they notice you and they go oh yeah okay we should we should calm down if you have one particular dog that's causing all the arousal that dog needs to be put in a crate to give be given a you know one or two minute time out just to let his arousal level come down and then let him back out but this is why when you get a dog that really really wants to play and they're just they come into your daycare raring to go it can often get the whole room into such a high state of arousal that it can be detrimental to the room as a whole so arousal and I'll talk about that through the next couple of weeks arousal is a very big thing to pay attention to if I'm meeting a dog for the first time and he's very very highly aroused I am gonna keep my behavior relatively calm to hopefully calm the dog down the last thing I want to do is get an, a highly aroused dog more aroused so I don't want to be doing a lot of horseplay or a lot of excitement we did a um, behavioral assessment on a dog that was really highly aroused one time and one of the parts of the assessment is see if you can get the dog running around and playing and with that particular dog it it ended exactly as we thought we it would if you got him more aroused he would start to bite um, in a in a fairly aggressive way so arousal and aggression is really important to pay attention to whether it's a single dog you're meeting or if it's you know a group of dogs playing together these are some of the resources that I would recommend if you're interested in doing more research or looking at more videos or looking at some dog footage pictures or videos or photos um, these are some of the best resources the calming signals book by Turgid, she, that she's sort of the person that started the whole idea of calming signals or stress signals. Language of Dogs is a fairly new DVD that just has come out within the past year that has lots of video footage of individual dogs showing individual stress signals, which is a really good um, DVD to watch. Patricia McConnell's book, which just came out um, a few months ago, has a lot of descriptions of the stress signals and is, a, is another good resource and then the Suzanne Hetz VHS also has you know individual body posture so if you want to look at those we have about 15 minutes or so left if anyone has any questions I'm going to open it up um, for you to just type any of your questions in I haven't gotten any so far if nobody has any questions then we'll end a few minutes early but if anyone has any questions they can just type those in and I'll give you a, a few minutes to do that we also have the Yahoo group. If you are not on the R Yahoo group and you want to be, just send me an email. You should have gotten an invitation. Um, the Yahoo group is completely voluntary. You don't have to be on it if you don't want to, but it's just a way in between um, sessions that we can talk to one another through that Yahoo group. So if you have questions you know, during the week, you can post it on the Yahoo group. You can also just email them directly to me if you don't want to do the Yahoo group. But if you do it through the Yahoo group, then everybody will obviously see it. 
Okay, the, um, one of the questions is what is piloerection? And I'll show you that on some of the video next, next week. Um, but it's basically when the hair on the back of the dog's neck and back stand up. So it's that hair going the opposite. Kind of if you think of a Rhodesian Ridgeback, how they have that ridge. Well, it's that on a dog that doesn't have a ridge normally. It's just their hair stands up on their back of their neck. I had another, well, actually a couple of different um, questions about the recording. And I, I, didn't rem I don't remember telling you this, but um, this, the webinar is being recorded. It'll be in Windows Media format. And once I download it, I'll put it on a website, and then you'll get a link to it to view it at your convenience. And generally, I'll leave that link up through the end of the webinar. So it'll be up there usually through the end of the webinar, which is six weeks from now. And then I usually leave it on about another four weeks after that. So basically, you have about two months, a little over two months, to watch it if you miss it. Um, and then I haven't looked into the production of this, but my plan is then to also make it available later on a DVD or CDs so that you can get them later to have permanently if you want them. And what I've done in the past with the teleconferences is, is that the attendees get that at a discounted rate. So it'll be offered for sale and then everybody who attended will actually be able to purchase it for much less. And usually that, usually those are done a couple of weeks after the whole six week session is done. So I had a couple of, of people ask those. Um, will I get a copy of the PowerPoint? Well, I can probably send a copy of the PowerPoint to everybody. Um, let me write that down or I'm going to forget. Um, I'll probably just send that through email so that you'll have those. When we do the PowerPoint with the video, you won't have the video on there because obviously I can't send the video. It's too um, the files are too large when I do the video, but you'll get the ones with the photos, you'll get those. Another question was, do you allow uh, more aroused dogs to come into the playgroup after it's been formed for a while? And do you do anything to make them tired, like the treadmill? I don't. I Well, let me start back over. I do let dogs that are aroused come into the playgroup, but I usually will wait for them to calm down a little bit. In other words, if they're standing at the gate, just barreling ready to go, and they're just really super aroused, I generally will just keep them at the gate for a few minutes. I might even take all the other dog. I might even take them into another room where they can't see all the other dogs, just to let them calm down for a second. And then I will let them come into the group, assuming that they've already been introduced, because there's there's a whole different way to introduce a brand new dog to a group of dogs. So I'm talking, this is how I would do it with a dog that's, they've been to daycare before, they know most of the dogs, I know them. I'm going to let them settle down a little bit and then I will let them come into the group. Um, I don't do anything to make them tired, although I have seen um, a few people who do talk about bringing a dog and putting them on a treadmill. I think there's advantages to that. Um, I think it is a good way to get a dog tired so that they can come into the group a little bit more calm, but I never felt like I needed to do that. Now, I do have rules about when people can bring their dogs. So if they're bringing their dog in in the morning, ideally most of my dogs were there by 9. So I had very few people that would show up like at 11 o'clock because my policy was that 11.30 they were going for a nap time. So if you showed up at 11, the dog was going to spend you know half an hour out and then go into a crate. And most people didn't want to do that, so they usually brought their dogs in early. Um, the treadmill idea, I think, has value if you, but you do have to have somebody that can be dedicated to the treadmill to work with the dog. So that's the only disadvantage I see to it is that if you talk about staffing a daycare and the overhead for the daycare and your profit in a daycare, staffing is one of the huge places where you are spending the most money, and that that's with the staff watching multiple dogs. You have one person watching, you know, 10 to 15 dogs. Now if you say you have to have one person out of the room to stay, because I would, if you're going to use a daycare, I would, I mean a treadmill, I would say it has to be separated from the other dogs for safety and somebody needs to stay with the dog. I don't think you should just hook the dog up to the treadmill and leave because that's really dangerous. <laughs> so that's the only thing you have to look at is staffing wise, can you do that and, it, and is it affordable? Because I would say for a treadmill to be effective, the dog would have to be on it 
probably at least 10 minutes, probably more like 10 to 20. So I would, that's the only disadvantage I would say. Not physically for the dog is probably a good thing, but in terms of staffing your daycare, I think it would be a little bit of an issue. I would look at just letting the dog settle down and then come in with a, a, a maybe a smaller group of dogs initially and then add the dogs as the, as the new dog settles in. Um, I had another question, which is, what do you recommend to an owner with a really high-stress dog? Is there a way to reduce stress, or do they just need to stay home? <laughs> or do they just need to stay home and not be put in situations like that with a lot of people? Um, yes and no. Yes, I do. There are certain things you can do with dogs that are high-stress, like with my shepherd, who is, she is a high-stress dog. There are certain situations I just won't put her in. So when we have big parties at my house, she starts her night almost always in the bedroom. Now, the last, my last um, party that I had at my house, it was all of my trainers came over. So there was about 25 people here, trainers and their families. And typically what my dog will do is she will seek out a private space. That's how I know why am I forcing her in this situation. If I give her, the, if I give her an option, she will generally go upstairs into the bedroom and lay on the bed. She wants out of the activity. Um, this last time I had her out, though, she actually stayed with the party. It was really funny to me. <laughs> but I've had her now for five years, and we've done lots of confidence-building stuff. So normally with a stressed dog, I recommend confidence-building behaviors. I rec so things like agility, things like you know setting up little obstacles in your yard and helping the dog to learn some of them. All of those build, build confidence in a dog, just like an obstacle course builds confidence in people. So you can do that kind of stuff. You can do basic training. Anytime the dog has an idea of what they can do as opposed to being afraid, you know, if they're feeling scared but you can tell them to do a trick and now all of a sudden they're like, oh, we're in like trick mode, okay, that changes their state of mind. If you, with my shepherd, if she's really, really nervous, I can often bring out a tennis ball and her, her state of mind completely changes because she's so fixated on the tennis ball that she becomes um, in a fun mode. So giving tennis balls to strangers was a great way to work with her. Here, toss my dog a tennis ball. Because you can't, just like we can't be, you can't be happy and angry at the same time. You have to choose one of those emotions over the other. And so if you do a lot of, if there's something your dog really, really likes and is really, really motivated with, you can use that as a training tool. Um, treats are often the same way. It, for my shepherd, the, the tennis ball actually was better than treats because in a lot of stressful situations she won't eat. So for using treats with her, for having a stranger give her treats didn't always work. But most of the time she would take a tennis ball from a stranger. Um, but yeah, there are times when I don't put her in situations. I took her one time to a training class at my office and it was horrible. She hated it. It was actually my daughter was working with her and I have two kids and two dogs. So one, each child brought a dog and my shepherd was miserable. And so the next day we agreed, my daughter and I agreed that that was not good for her and we didn't bring her because she was fine. <laughs> she was in that fine category. She was tolerating everything really well. She wasn't showing aggression, but she wasn't happy. So there are situations where I say that's just who she is and I need to know that about her and, and keep her out of those kinds of situations. So that's sort of a multiple answer for that. Um, and then I had another question on what are the best tools or DVDs to use to train staff members. Some of the resources listed on here, the language of dogs, I would definitely recommend for training staff, and I'm assuming this is, well, actually, that would be either daycare staff or dog trainers. Um, the language of dogs is a really good DVD. I like on talking terms, but it can be very slow and sometimes mind-numbingly slow. <laughs> so if you have really short clips that you can watch on that, it's, it's a little bit more... Um, easier to swallow, but to watch the whole thing really all at once is a lot. The language of dogs is actually done in clips where you can go to certain specific stress signals and watch them really quickly in multiple dogs, so I like that one. Um, and then if you can recommend reading, I would definitely recommend Patricia McConnell's book. For, I also will shamelessly plug my book, um, <laughs> is another one that has excerpts that your staff can read. There's a whole section in my book which is all about dog daycare on staff behavior. And this, I mean staff behavior, uh, body behavior in dogs for your staff to read. Um, there's, I'm in the process of 
working on another book, which is actually a staff training manual for dog daycare owners, which I'm co-writing and hopefully will be out in September. So I would look for that too um, in the upcoming months. But that is going to be geared specifically towards training staff, and it'll be done as a as a workbook type of program where they read the book and then they take a test, which is located in another workbook. But right now, there's really nothing out there that's like that that specifically tests your daycare staff. But in the in the meantime, I would look at some of those other DVDs that should help. Okay, I think I covered all of the questions. And we will meet again next Thursday at the same time. If you have any comments or suggestions or questions or anything, feel free to email me directly or email the Yahoo group if you want to be on that. And otherwise, I will plan on talking to everybody in about a week if I don't talk to you before then. But I appreciate everyone's attention and... I hope that this was helpful to you. And starting next week, we'll be having some uh, video footage as well as pictures. Our next week's topic is, let me pull out my sheet. Next week's topic is going to be on play style. So all the various types of play styles you'll get um, when dogs are interacting with other dogs and to some extent with people, but really when, and when they're interacting with other dogs. So that's what we're going to um, look at next week. All right. Well, I will talk to everybody later. And thanks. Have a good evening.